So good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome once again to our monthly community webinar. Uh, my name is uh, David Johnson, uh, the CVO, uh, Chief Vision Officer of our Prop Funders Company. And we do these uh, events usually monthly, and it's a great opportunity to try and provide some free education uh, for those that either tune in live or those that uh, decide to watch the recording. Uh, so absolutely fantastic um, guest today. Uh, I'll let them introduce themselves just in a second um, after we do some of our normal housekeeping slides. Um, but I'm really, really excited uh, about all, all the guests that we have on here today. So um, we're going to come on to them for a really good uh, panel discussion uh, around uh, investor mindset, particularly um, what happens when projects go wrong. So I know you've got all got lots to say about that and, and some valuable insight. So I will be uh, coming to all of you panelists just in a few moments. But let's just um, do some of the housekeeping stuff initially. So uh, for those that aren't aware of um, prop funders and who we are, what we do, uh, our mission statement is to empower SME property developers to build more homes by disrupting the alternative funding market. That's very much what we're about, helping SME developers uh, to get more homes and houses and property built in the UK uh, to help deal with the, the crisis that we all know exists. In terms then of how we do that, um, we've got a, a, our own platform called Prop Funders. Um, when they then go on, have a look at how we do free education. Uh, we then have some services specifically to help um, developers and fundraisers. And then we also have um, what we call funding partners, where we can introduce mm -hmm. developers and fundraisers uh, to different funding sources. That's for debt and for equity. So really, we're here uh, to support, provide services, help, expertise, and all of that. Uh, for those who are looking to raise funds, be that debt or equity. That's very much what we're about. Now, I always like to get uh, a wee update on the, the housing market. Uh, and I will let any of the guests, panelists, guests comment on this um, when I mentioned the, the, the brief key points. Um, I actually had called in there a few weeks ago with uh, Mike, uh, Mike Bristow of Bright Property. Uh, he does do a monthly state of the market. So I thought, Hey, what better than just to pick out some of his key points and file them on the screen for today. So uh, Mike's key takeaways, and he is, of course, someone who has his finger on the pulse of the UK uh, property market. So number one, UK prices and mortgage approvals reach a, a two-year high, which is good news. Uh, house building activity accelerates at the fastest pace for the last two years. Again, uh, and then we have further interest rate cut speculation. Of course, that continues. And property investors bracing themselves for EPC pressures um, and rising costs. So any of the, the panelists want to comment on any of those points? Anything you would agree with or disagree with? Yeah, well, we're suddenly seeing mortgage rates come down and uh, interest in new buyers coming back onto the market. I think a lot of people that have been sitting on the fence kind of unsure about whether it's the right time to buy and now coming back to the market. And we're certainly seeing it when it comes to acquisition uh, of properties. There's a lot more competition. Um, you're competing with other buyers to get properties, whereas I would say a year ago, that wasn't really the case. Um, and then, yeah, house building. So things like planning, approvals, it's definitely becoming the, um, it's definitely kind of, that's the trend right now. So new developments tend to get, uh, I think that's the, the kind of an industry trend right now where people are looking to invest in new developments and new housing to to meet the housing shortage. So I can agree with you there, David. Yeah. Um, I think what I would say, just on further interest rate cut, speculation continues. Um, yes, that's a great thing. But um, what about those investors and developers who um, were stuck right when the um when Liz Trust uh decided to do her thing and at that point when in entered into you know most of their mortgage rates were coming to an end they entered into new agreements stuck in five year agreements that are now coming down um and so i think that's kind of disrupting the market just a little bit yeah no i think that's i think that's very fair it's a good observation uh, Sam, anything you want to add to that? 
Yeah, I just wanted to say, yeah, I, I would say, say that people are starting to get a con con confidence in, in the market again, because as uh, my previous speaker said, there are people that are stuck. There are the new people that will be emerged to the property because so they have not have had the the, the this uh, rates hike, and then there's a talk of the higher rates coming down. So that will help them. So I think that's, what, that's my take on it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Thank you very much. Very, very useful. Um, so we will um, get on from there. So um, I'm going to just play about one minute of the start of a video. So Todd normally comes on and uh, does a segment uh, around marketing um, and social media for developers and, and some cases related to investors as well. Um, so he's actually recorded something for us today. Um, and we're going to put the link out with our next funding focus. But um, this should play if... Um, uh, if one of the panelists just gives me a thumbs up if they hear the sound okay on this um, and it should it should play okay Hello everyone on the prop funders webinar i am todd walker and i would like to apologize for not being here in advance but today we're going to run through a little bit of marketing on how to address different avatars in property well for a start we need to know who they are and then we can understand why it's going to be important to us so if you're in property often or not you're going to need some sort of funding you're going to need some people to work for you in terms of helping you get things done and you're going to need properties which comes through sort of homeowners and estate agents so the types of people that you're going to need usually are investors employees or business partners so jv partners and or homeowners such estate agents and it is crucial that you understand that Hello everyone on the prop funders David, um, I can't hear you. Yeah, I thought I was the only one. What about now? Yes. Okay. Uh, the joys of technology once again. Um, yeah, so saying that was a very brief um, uh, video from Todd. It's about 14 minutes long. We're going to put it in the next funding focus. Um, it's too long to play on this one hour um, community webinar, but some really good insights into how to... Um, decide on, on client avatars, investor avatars, in terms of um, all, all, all of that side of marketing. So very, very good. So last thing before we jump on to our panel, um, if you haven't already, um, make sure you go on and subscribe on our YouTube channel to our funding uh, podcast. Um, nice, simple, easy name to remember, the Property Funding Podcast. Um, we've actually nine uh, recordings on there currently. Um it's actually over a thousand views on YouTube. I've managed to forget to add on one of the zeros. Um, so ac across our, our different um, episodes of over a thousand views on YouTube, we're also on Spotify um, and a great wealth of different um, uh, people have come along, different guests. Uh, the last one is actually my own solicitor uh, in Belfast, who's got many, many years experience um, in the world of property and some great stories to tell. Um, so he's a, a very, very um, interesting uh, background in, in the whole world of property throughout the whole of the UK. Um, but we've had a, a bunch of amazing guests um, on here and uh, I no doubt there'll be more uh, very, very soon. So if you haven't already, please get on there, um, find out the ones you like the best, watch them, um, subscribe and uh, get the value of these podcasts. So without any further ado, thank you for the patience of the, the panelists. Uh, let's get into our topic for today, uh, investor mindset. Um, particularly looking at when projects go wrong. Um, so, so first of all, if um, each of you just give sort of like a one minute background um, of what you've done in property, the type of projects you've invested in, uh, maybe what you do now is your, is your main business if it's not directly property. Um, and then we'll break off and go through a bunch of, of, of key points to discuss. So sort of one, one minute each, we'll go with that. Thembi, we'll start with you. Just quick overview introduction, please. Okay, hi, can you hear me? Yes, perfect. Okay, yeah. Hi, my name is Tembi. Uh, I am uh, based in Northern Ireland, same as David. I I invest in um, two beds in, in buy to lets. So what I've started with, I started with buy to lets, now I pivot to um, 
service accommodation and the and and, and the, the emergency accommodation. So that's me. And then I'm currently focusing mainly on the property now. I I used to work um as a data analyst in different and in uh, my my background is in IT. So I just like uh, finished in June. So that's me. Brilliant. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, we'll go um, Aria next, please. Hi, well, thanks for having me on the show today, David. So my name is Ari. Um, generally, over the last seven years, I've actually been primarily focused in the tech industry and uh, work for a tech company which went public, um, now listed on NASDAQ. And over the last four or five years, I've kind of pivoted from, well, not, not, not just, but investing into property specifically here in the UK. Um, either working directly with developers on specific development uh, projects, anything ranging from HMO conversions, existing building developments, uh, buying equity in deals. Some of that's been done directly with developers and sometimes through crowdfunding platforms. Um, so that's my that's my experience. Brilliant. Fantastic. And uh, Lorraine? Hi, everyone. I'm Lorraine Thomas. I'm a property mentor. I'm a developer and uh, an investor with a social purpose. I say with a social purpose because we tend to rent to people who um, don't tick all the boxes. So they may be doing two, three jobs, but they still probably wouldn't pass the standard credit check or landlord requirement. So we rent to those that are largely disadvantaged. Um, my patch is down in Croydon, um, sunny Croydon, and um, I've dabbled in ground up and um, love going to auction. That's me. Very good, very good. Through the, the auction one at the end there. Excellent, excellent. Yeah. And uh, I think, um, Obviously, with with some of you, I've I've actually invested in some of the same projects that, that, that you have invested in. So I've I've got to know I've got to know all of you um you know, over, over the, the last number of years um to, to, to various degrees. Um and that's I'm really keen and looking forward to this discussion um around around today's uh, today's topic. So we're gonna get slightly straight into it. Uh, I'm gonna come off the screen so people can obviously get a, a better view of the discussion, but uh, the, there are the sort of the the gui the guiding conversation points, if you like. So I'm going to run down these sort of one, one by one. But let's come off the uh, this first and get to there we go. Different view and gallery view. Perfect. So uh, that first question then was very much around of the projects you've invested in. What percentage have went the plan? What percentage have gone off the rails? Oh, okay. So, as a as to start off, um, I started as an accidental landlord. So, and then I, I moved on to become um the property investor. So the I would say, um, twenty percent went uh off rails, and then eighty percent went okay. So, and then also it that. The proper as as you as everybody else would know that property is not any any project you worked on is not always uh, straightforward and then property has things that especially if you are not you are not uh, experienced like I was when I started it's it it has all all sorts of things that are thrown into you and then starting with them um, with the if you work on a project uh, with the the contractors, I mean the tradesmen, and then again you need to when you when I'm talking about tradesmen, you you need to know the people that are on your project. You need to know they you should not just go in and say, okay, they, I want this to be wire, this house to be wired, and then not giving a specific where do we want the wires, where do you want the plugs mm -hmm. in, what mm -hmm. kind of plugs I go you want to to, to have, and then that. That if you just give a just blank canvas, then you'll get a problem. So that's what yeah, I've learned. Yeah. Those are the problems that I've experienced through. I mean, what you don't know, you don't know. So that's our yeah, set. Yeah. Um, but by to 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 say, um, 
to correct that is that you you need in property people in property are very giving if you lean or glean to people that with the knowledge then you end up on the other side and then also it helps to have what you want at the end of it yeah yeah no i, I think that's that, that's uh yes yeah, a very good point that in terms of the the, the initial bit you reckon about twenty percent of your projects have, have have gone wrong, which is which is grand. So, Lorraine, what about you? Just as a general percentage, so anything, I, I want to say I'm the opposite. Eighty <laughs> percent, probably, <laughs> when I first started, went wrong, right? Okay. And only twenty percent right. So that's why I can truly say I'm an expert and come to me because I, I, I literally, you can always learn from people who've made the mistakes, been there, suffered and lost money. So um, it's interesting that you um, commented, Thembi, about if uh, you don't give instruction, you end up with a blank canvas because that's exactly, that's exactly right. Communication and guidance along the way, um, you can't do it alone. You've got to have buy-in, you've got to have communication, you've got to be on the same page as all of those people that you are working with. Yeah. And back to that point about, you know, actually the investor mindset, I was thinking about why, why do so many projects actually go wrong? Is it because people don't start off with the right, mindset and um i was thinking we've just come back from bali we're sitting on the beach most people have bali on their bucket list everything was perfect everything was rosy the sea sand was white the sea was blue the landscape was great but we couldn't get into the water and there were red flags either side on the beach saying do not go into the water and i kind of thought actually that's like an investor's mindset because you've got to have the vision that one that shortly the water's going to calm down and you will be able to get into it if you don't have that view and that vision that actually it is possible but you you've just got to sit there and and almost wait mm -hmm. it out and then yeah. you've got to have the resilience and then you've got to think oh okay well there's some continuous learning here as well mm -hmm. because if i go in and the waves get me then it's kind of my fault because I didn't look at the red flags that were either side, but continuous learning in that, you know, if, if you don't die, what's the worst that can happen? It's, it's yeah. you know, save up for the learning bag. Yeah, that's, yeah, no, that, that's, a, I think that's, a, yeah, that's an interesting mindset of how to, how to approach that. You mentioned red flags there, which we'll, we'll definitely mention in a few moments because it's one of, my, one of my points. But so we've had 20% sort of, off the rails 80 percent good and then we've had 80 percent off the rails 20 percent good so it looks like ari you're going to have the casting vote in this one area so what sort of, what <laughs> well, sort of percentage? I, I think your, your question was how many you know what percentage of projects don't go to plan and i think the majority of, of property projects don't go to plan because you always start at you start on paper and you think about a timeline how long is it going to take to you know run the project from beginning to end and how much is it going to cost Mm -hmm. and very little there's always something which comes up which you don't plan for you don't anticipate you don't expect and then you'll find that projects will either overrun on time or they'll override on overrun on funds and usually both so the truth the truth is most projects which i've done i don't think any uh, you know probably more on the 80 percent side i don't think that they've that means that they've completely derailed but yeah that's a good point. it's been you know long delays to to delivery times to exits to completions and also overrun overrun on funding so I would yeah. say yes. I'm also in the eighty percent kind of um, category there. I figure. Okay, you you actually make a really good point because with hindsight, I probably didn't frame that question as defined as I could have, because as you say, probably most projects don't go exactly to plan. I suppose the big question is, at what point they don't go to plan, that there's then no profit in the deal, or there's then a problem that actually becomes, you know, threatens the whole project. Um, but but yeah, think, yeah that's, that's a good point. Um, yeah, I think uh, not going to plan doesn't mean that it's all over. Not going to plan just means it took a different path, right? That's a good point. So, yeah. And yeah. that's kind of where the the investor mindset has to be that yeah. you will get yeah. there if you've got the vision and you've got the risk yeah. appetite. Yeah. yeah.
And other thing I wanted to throw in is that you need to, whatever whatever plan, whatever projected fee funding that you um, money that you have set aside is good to put up a, a certain percentage of 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 a buffer amount, a contingent contingency plan to know that what if this does not go wrong? You have to have not only rely on as a plan plan A. You see what else could you do, plan mm -hmm. B. Yeah, no, I guess a very good point. Contingency, and we'll come on that in a minute as well about some of the things. So, uh, red flags were mentioned there. It's an expression I, I love when it comes to property development and investing uh, because I think there are clear, at times can be clear red flags, both when you're looking at an initial project, but the question I have for you in, in terms of, of this discussion is, um, in your experience, have you found there has been some telltale signs or some red flags that a project that looked okay is beginning to go off the rails. Can can you speak to any? And I should have I should have said at the start we're we're not going to mention any absolute specific projects. We don't want to get ourselves into uh, a situation of maybe uh, uh, libel or something like that. Of course, um. So we're not going to say. I don't want you to say like where it is, name of the project. But if you can speak to any project where you thought it was going okay, and then there was just some red flags. What what were they? And, and what did you do about them? So, uh, Ari, maybe kick off with you in this one. Sure. Well, I, I've had it both ways. So I've had um, developers which I've worked with directly where the communication has been very, very positive and where issues have arisen, they've been upfront about it. And even where it's required, you know, additional funding or kind of creative thinking about how we solve those problems together. And actually, when, when things are kind of, when the red flags are raised in time by the people that, it's in their kind of responsibility to raise it. It's always easier to solve it when things are kind of just being hidden and, and you're, you're kind of left to discover the, the red flags after long after the, the fact and after the event. So I've had it both ways. Um, I think that developers which communicate openly and honestly with, with investors, generally um, it's easier to, to work in, 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 in that kind of uh, relationship. But I've had also experiences where I've invested in projects where uh, only at the very last minute, investor, uh, the, the developer kind of shared material information, which actually presented the fact that the, the project had been off the rails for a good six months without any of the investors being aware of that. So it, it can be hard and it, it can be hard to pick up on the red flags and, unless you're really getting the communication which you need to have with your uh, joint venture partner or, or property developer. Mm -hmm. Very good. Lorian, any telltale signs yeah. that you've come across Gosh, red flags all over the place i'll just give one one example um, so i look at the numbers before your lender does um especially if you're doing development because if they spot that there's a time issue and we're running against the clock and the project's taking a lot longer than it should and there are a lot of unforeseen things such as maybe groundwork problems, uh, design issues, lots of things that the lender can pick up on. Um, and they get wind of every report. They can see more and more problems occurring. They could pull the plug on you. So it might be worth thinking about, well, this lender's given me maybe 12 months, 18 months. They're now getting a little bit nervous. Do I think about refinancing before they pull the plug on me and um, call it in? So I think it's just really being being honest with yourself, being honest with your investors, being honest with your team that this is going to run over and maybe we need to swiftly go on to plan B um, so that it's less painful, and more of a transition. Mm -hmm. If I if I put it this way to to youth MB, um, is there is a big factor in this perhaps the amount of money the investors invested? So if someone has invested obviously a substantial amount of money, let's say tens of thousands of pounds, maybe as a JV investor, um, well they're maybe going to be more minded to be on top of the updates, the communications, what's happening with the project. If someone has, has invested, you know, hundred pound, a thousand pound, um. If you're a crowdfunding platform, for instance, it's probably not high up their radar. 
uh, and therefore they're perhaps not looking and paying attention on a on a monthly basis per se. So uh, Dink, I mean, is that maybe a factor in identifying red flags? You've got to really be looking and 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 you know being aware that there could be red flags as opposed to just waiting for a developer to come back to you. Um, I would say in, in any project, um, David, that you're working on and then you are especially, most especially when you are using uh, people's money, you have to be on, on, you have to be on board what's happening and then be like, I would take, talk example, speak about example whereby I had um the I had money from the investor so and then I had to make sure that each and every stage I notify the investor on the progress a communication as a previous speaker a communication is the key and then just be uh, open up and then be honest and then be honest with people that are that that you got the money from and then ask the people that are you that you employed to do your project ask sit down with them and then ask specific questions that's what i've learned throughout the property because if you just say you less you say how is the progress and then tell me in percentage how far are you and then let them ex explain to you and expect and then go if if the project is or you are able you to go and visit go and visit and then point out and you you point to them said you told me that you're going to finish xyz by this time and then explain why so that's what i'm yeah. saying so so I mean, yeah to, 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 to tease out what you were saying there then be good there's two takeaways there for me there's one you've got to ask the right questions when you're talking yes. to the developer stroke fundraiser so it's 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 being specific in the questions you ask and then you also mentioned yes. site visit I mean, fantastic. The amount of investors who could have known um, that the project had gone off the rail sooner. Um, and I know it, not everyone can do it, personal circumstances or whatever, but if you've invested a, a large chunk of money, particularly in the UK, you, you can just travel there. Go, go there and actually see it. Uh, I think it's such an important part of the initial due diligence. But sometimes once the initial investment's made, and, and particularly if you're a passive investor in a deal, there's then just a, you know, you went into passive mode. We don't have to be. You can be in, in pro proactive mode as an investor and, and go and visit. Don't even tell the, the developer you're coming. Just turn up on site and 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 have a look at the project for yourself. I've done. <laughs> and you've you've done that. Yeah, yeah, very good. So you've yeah, done that as well. So I flew to England and then I they were telling me and then the pictures were not coming and then I, was, I didn't see the, the the progress as much as I wanted and then I just said and then I because I had somebody that I worked with before and then he was very trustworthy but I was just worried about what's going on here and then I flew to the place and then I just said oh I didn't tell that I'm saying I said oh well I'm just here in Manchester so and then can I meet you on site or this specific time I'll be there around about two o'clock so and then the main investor and sort of the main project lead all of a sudden he was sick and then the person that the only different people that came in just to and then i just pointed out a few things and they said you said you are going to be finished by this such and such a time and then you wanted a certain amount of money up front and other thing that another red flag is that whenever you are working uh, with the contractors and then if they ask so much money up front that's a that's a red flag rather than maybe twenty five percent. So because you end up losing because they might go away and then finish Joe Block's job while that they started yeah. by your funds. So that's my experience. Yeah, yeah, and that's not yeah again another good sort of red flag in terms of that things are going wrong. We'll be asking for more money um, during the development, uh, which gets back to the numbers which Lorraine mentioned. You also mentioned communication there again. Go ahead, Lorraine, come in there. Yeah, I just wanted to say, because you picked up on something that has touched a nerve with me, because sometimes um, when you invest in, say, a platform and you've invested just as it, it really largely depends on what your motivation was mm -hmm. and um, why did you invest in the first place? So I've uh, on bigger deals. Yes, um, the story slightly different. 
But on smaller deals where um, I've invested just to find out how a platform works, um, perhaps just to, you know, have it that I've diversified my um, my portfolio. Um, I, I might have wanted a little bit of learning. Well, how, how does, you know, how, how do you actually present your your opportunity to investors? So there are lots of different reasons why you invest in something and you might take your eye off the ball, as I have done in the past, because you're trusting that the platform is going to do all the work. You are trusting that the mm -hmm. um, that the project's going to run smoothly because they've presented to you. They seem OK, switched on. Everything's rosy. All the boxes are ticked. So sometimes you take your eye off that ball because you're trusting that the updates and that the people you've invested in are going to be okay. I'm not justifying that you should take your eye off the ball, but I'm saying that it can happen and it has happened to me. Yeah, yeah I, I fully agree as well, as well, Lorraine. I think it's, it's a big difference when you're investing small amounts for a crowdfunding plat platform to when you're investing directly with the with the developer or, or whoever's running the projects and you're funding a significant part of that um, that project. And definitely the way that I would approach the, the second uh method would be completely different to how I would kind of look at a, a crowdfunding investment, um, which is probably not, not best, but that's just, just the way it is when you've got more skin in the game. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that's a fair point. The skin in the game point is the, is probably the, the key thing there. Um, and it is interesting, Lorraine, you raise an interesting point because having obviously been in the regulated space and ran an equity property crowdfunding platform as, as the panelists know, and probably most of the, uh, the attendees know um, it is interesting that, no matter how often risk warnings are mentioned, you know, capital at risk terms not guaranteed, no matter about the entry level um, test, the appropriateness test that has to be done where people are saying, look, we understand the risk, you know, despite all of those kind of warnings and pointers, still when projects do go wrong, there's that investor that says to you, but we invested in this because it was on your platform. And it's like, yes, but, you know, the platform is not responsible for knowing every single thing about the project on a daily basis over an 18 month project. You know, if it, the platform will only know what it knows when it's told it by the developer very often than not. So yeah. it is an interesting mindset that sometimes there is, well, it's on a platform, therefore it must be okay. That there's certainly a level of due diligence done, but once the project starts, well, then it's very difficult for a platform to be across, you know, 25, 30, 40 projects at WAMI, you'd have to have five or six full-time staff doing nothing but visiting sites every day of the week to stay on top of them all. So yeah, it's an interesting um now what that lead, leads on really something that Thembi mentioned um and really speaks to what we're talking about now, probably, and that is the area of communication. Um and and um, Arya mentioned that as well. So how yeah, as as simple and as blunt as how important is developer communication to investors when a project is not going to plan so i think i think for me like in anything in business trust is, is the biggest currency which you can have and to me communication is probably first and foremost one of the most important things even above the success of the project so if things aren't going well i want to know about it and um Whenever I go into an investment directly with a developer, one of the first things that we'll do is we'll kind of talk about how uh, the communication should look like. Mm -hmm. um, so I'd expect to have regular calls with the with a developer to get a progress uh, update, even to the point where I'm even from the due diligence phase, we're talking about Gantt charts and looking what needs to be done when and when's the schedule of work and what's the current process, you know, what's the current progress which we've got against what we anticipated to have. Uh, and I think people here at MB mentioned uh, site visits. So that's also something to me, which is quite important if I'm uh, investing with with a developer. So I think that there are, for, for me, communication is something which is extremely important. And um, if whenever I go to make an investment, that's always going to be one of the conditions of, of investment is, is open communication consistently. Um, and uh, where where issues you know do where, where issues do arise, then I expect to be informed about it. And in some ways, I can help. In some some ways, it's going to be out of my control. Um, but at least if I'm I'm informed and aware of what's going on, then nothing's going to surprise me later on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think some really really good points there. 
So Lorraine or Thembe, um, just in terms of this, how important mm -hmm. is communication when a project's not going to plan? Well, Arias said it really. I mean, it, it's it's the number one thing, isn't it? Um, and I think it's really important. Why? Because you set your, you start off communicating well, you set the agenda, you've got an agreement going, but people change. The way I am today isn't the way I might be tomorrow. And so if I don't know what the end looks like, I might know it on paper, you know, we've agreed that at the end of this project, we're going to sell, reinvest, refinance, whatever, but actually things change. So if I don't know what you're thinking, how do I know that you're thinking it? So unless you are, you've got that continuous communication and you really are on the same page and you know who you're in bed with, things that's when things go pear-shaped because what you thought they had agreed to may not be where they are in the current project and the state yeah. of the current project yeah. and this comes up time and time again and um we say everybody knows communication well yeah communication's key but actually it changes so frequently throughout a project that that's why it's the number one important thing i think a hundred percent agree and i think that things change in the project like you said you know the initial plan might be that we refinance but then we don't get the valuation that we want so we decide to rent it out and those are things which happen and i think when going into a partnership or a jv partnership where you're putting up the funds and someone else is doing the legwork of the development i want to be able to also have control over decisions which are being made um so that's the other thing it's not just okay well the developer's communicating to me but i'm actually taking an active part in in the direction the project's going as well so that's also important Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I agree with that. I, I want it any more. They mentioned all what I was thinking about, and also with the, I mean, that communication as well. It has to be open and frank, because if you, I mean, you have to establish upfront that you know we need to everything. You have to be transparent, trans transparent. So that's very that is important. Mm -hmm. That's all I'm going to say. Yeah. No. Again, I think some some really good points there, and I think. Probably one of the biggest learning curves that, that I had running the crowdfunding platform was the um, expectation that we would say update the investors on a monthly basis. And then if we didn't get an update from the developer and then we didn't like tell the investors we didn't get an update was actually realizing how annoyed the investors were at not even getting a simple message that said, no change, no further update. You know, initially we were kind of like, well, if there's no new news, there's nothing to send out. But the investor feedback was very, very firmly and something that uh, that uh, my old friend John Corey would have would have hammered us on as part of his advisory role, um, board member role. Uh, and that was if a developer doesn't deliver an update, the platform should still communicate to the investors, we have not received an update. You know, I was a bit fearful of throwing the developer under the bus probably sometimes by sort of chasing them. They would say, yeah, yeah, I'll send it to you. And then maybe genuinely something happened on their side and they weren't able to send it. So rather than make the fundraiser look bad in front of the investors, maybe initially we were kind of like trying to cover for the fundraiser a bit. Um, you soon learn that there's, you know, uh, there's no point in that or there's no value in that, 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 if developers right early on stop communicating properly, the sooner you tell the investors, the better. Because the investors then can can judge, if you like, and be more aware of, hang on, this person was communicating regularly. Now they're not. Is there is there something I should read into that? Is, is there genuinely something going on here? So I agree, communication is massive and probably one of my biggest disappointments um, in, in probably recent you know, six, seven, eight months. Again, not going to mention any particular project, but we certainly had projects where um, fundraisers, in some cases, did multiple raises. Projects went very well. Um, and then there's been a project that's gone wrong. And I suppose you only really get to see um, people's integrity, people's transparency, whenever things are going wrong. It's easy when everything's going well, but... It's harder for people to have the integrity, developers to have the integrity particularly, to be really open and transparent. Uh, and the last thing I'll say on this, which I think is actually 
massively overlooked um, when when it comes to um, the multiple passive investors. Very often, investors can help be part of the solution. So rather than developers burying their head in the sand, going ostrich mode, as I call it, and just pretending that the problems might go away sometime down the line and don't tell the investors, had they, and this is a 100% true, had developers raised their hand early doors to their investors and went, hey, I'm having this problem with the funding partner. I'm having this problem with construction. I'm having this problem with planning. Can anybody here bring any expertise? Almost invariably, there's an investor in, in, in the team or in the group that could actually be part of the solution. So unless you communicate and talk, yeah, I can get that. I don't want to, I don't want to sort of take take that ball and run with it. Totally agree. And um, continuous learning, as I keep saying, it's uh, it, yeah, uh, totally agree with everything you say um, on that point, David. Okay, so um, let, let's get into the real nitty gritty now. Let's say you've you've invested in a deal, and uh, there's the potential that something has not been above board in the deal what what form of redress or have you had any experience again not mentioning any particular projects but have you had any experience where you've actually taken either legal action but part of legal action or how have you went about deciding whether or not legal action is even appropriate so so what would you do if you went, hang on something's not right here not happy this is above board what what's your next step um, I, I think it really, that's something which you need to think about, even from the due diligence phase, when you go into a specific project, even before you get to the stage where something's gone wrong. So you need to know what your options are and be aware of what they are before you reach that stage. Because if you only, if you encounter the problem and then you start to look at, okay, what's my action for redress, then you're going to start finding that you've got some problems. And I think it really depends as well on the way that you finance the deal. So if we're looking at loans, it's always much easier to have some form of redress. You can get a second charge against a different property in, in the developer's portfolio or the same one, or that you've got much less risk where something goes wrong of getting your money back. But when you're looking at an equity deal where you funded, um, you, you're really at the bottom of the pecking chain in terms of getting your money back once you've got the principal lender that's obviously going to to have the first charge on the property and you you you're effectively left with whatever's left in 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 the uh, in the accounts and that's something which you need to be aware of and it's something which you need to um think about in terms of you know what if i reach that situation and what are my what are my options in an equity deal unfortunately going down the legal route to try and chase after money it's it, it's You've got low chances of success there. You'll just be burning more money against um, chasing money, which you you won't necessarily be able to get back. So there's a lot to think about, and I think it's it's really a case by case basis, uh, depending on how you've how you've invested. Uh, fortunately, I've not really been in the position where I've considered legal action against um, any particular party, um, but I am within my network of, of people that have, have had to do that or considering doing that. So it's always something to think about when going into a project. Mm -hmm. Lorraine or Thembe, any any tangible examples where you've actually been involved in in legal action or discussed it with other shareholders or investors? Um, unfortunately, with my experience, I've not had any issue with the with the going through that that into into the in, in with the taking people to legal action or anything. So, if the, the project that I've invested in, so I've no. I have no experience in that area yet. I'm going to tackle the question slightly differently. I think um, in order to protect yourself, you need at the start of any deal to have the right paperwork, the right insurances, mm -hmm. the right cover, the right protection. But oftentimes you think, oh, I've got insurance, you know, if it, the building falls down or if the developer walks off site or whatever the case may be. But actually read that small print. And if you don't know how to do that, get somebody else to really cross check it for you. Because we've had issues where we thought we took out insurance. We thought we were fully covered for X, Y, Z. But actually when the problem arose, the insurance didn't cover that aspect. 
didn't cover that aspect, didn't cover that aspect. Now, had we known that that was going to be the case, we would have got a lawyer to fully check over our insurance policy before we went ahead with it. Because sometimes you think you're covered and actually you're not. So get as, as much professional advice, I would say, as you possibly can. Yep, I think that's... Uh... That's already really good. Someone's uh, I forgot actually to invite questions um or, earlier um which was my my mistake my miss but someone has put a question up there and I think it speaks a little bit to Lorraine what you were talking about um about investing through a, a property uh, investment platform um and then maybe obviously having some confidence in that platform as part of your investment decision and then that platform going out of business um what are the repercussions for investors um and, and and the the process for that um uh, i mean if I, i'll maybe just comment on that initially and then get 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 you know all your feedback i, I think all of you have invested in in crowdfunding in some form or another from 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 our my knowledge of your our relationship um so the, i suppose in some ways it depends whether it's a debt platform or an equity platform there's a massive difference in that if it's a debt platform obviously then there's a a legal charge over the property um, and the platform is, was fully involved in producing, you know, the paperwork and the legal charge that goes with that. So if a, if a platform went out of business, there would still be security there in place um, over the property as a form of redress uh, to, to the investors. Um, equity is definitely different. Uh, and Aria mentioned equity a few minutes ago about the, the, the difficulty even in, in, in normal equity investing of recouping money if a project goes wrong. Um, so when it comes to, to equity platforms, I think one of the beauties of equity property crowdfunding is that investors do not invest in a platform. They invest directly in the SPV that owns the asset. The platform is not even a party to the shareholder agreement. They have facilitated the deal. They have facilitated the, the investment, but they're not a party to the investment. So, so similar to an estate agent who puts a house on the market on their website and in their shop, uh, someone comes in and buys it. Well, the estate agent isn't part of the of the sale contract. You know, they literally just facilitated the investment, and that's the same for equity property crowdfunding platforms. Um, so the repercussions for investors um, is negligible for if you've invested through an equity property crowdfunding platform because you're still a shareholder in the SPV, you have direct access to the developer. So the issue is more, if a developer carries on doing a good job, then the fact the crowdfunding platform doesn't exist is, is almost incidental. I suppose where it does become painful or more painful is if a project goes wrong, that's been invested through a platform that no longer exists. Um, I can, there's definitely a frustration there that back to communication. So again, I don't know what all the experience you guys have in that directly, but any any comments on that? I think my only comment would be, and you said it, you hit the nail on the head, you are still a shareholder because you've directed direct you've invested directly with the developer or or the, or the project. So that's the good news. The bad news is you've got to find if it, if it's going tits up then you've got to find a way of maybe suggesting helping that developer to get out of the problem so you can get your money back mm -hmm. um but the harsh reality is you should only invest what you can afford to lose um yeah. and yeah. that's the harsh reality yeah of yeah. yeah which, which is, is why really good you have, which is why you say you know you invest in these platforms you need to be a sophisticated investor and understand that actually a bit like horse racing if you can't afford to bet bet on the horse don't don't bet at all because okay. there's no yeah. sure thing that it's going to win right so yeah yeah no it's, it's a very fair point and again speaking bluntly as being a platform with all the regulation and all the risk warnings that have to painfully put in the investment to then sometimes have investors come back and say well, this is your fault. It's kind of like, well, I'm sorry, it's not. You know, you you invested based on information provided. Yes, we provide the information, but you still made the decision to invest. 
uh, ultimately you have to take responsibility for your investment or if you want to have blame going out around that you should never invest it in the first place because that that is the criteria the fca have laid out you, you have to prove that you can afford to lose this money you have to prove you understand risk you have to prove you understand these investments aren't liquid um and, and you have to prove you understand that otherwise you should never be investing that's just the harsh the harsh reality you know so so the, the last last one here as we wrap up um and i think um Arya alluded to this earlier which i thought was really encouraging so let's let's try and end on a positive because we all know projects have gone wrong it's painful it's horrible you know i got into crowdfunding initially because i'd had two clients of mine one a friend of my father's who lost over a hundred thousand pounds in deals that that i had brought to them to look at uh, again it was only an introducer it was only saying here here's an investment um but it's an awful awful feeling when when you're part of a project that, that goes south and people lose money it's horrible but it's also reality it's just it, it's it's business it's called investment for a reason uh, and that is it can go well or it might might go well last question then can developers and fundraisers um keep a good reputation even if a project has failed so uh, a, a project's gone wrong investors have lost all their money in your estimation as investors can that developer fundraiser keep a good reputation with you I, I think that they can and it depends entirely on them so it really depends on how they manage the situation and how they handle it so if they're open and honest from the beginning share the facts as they are um i can't say that if if it's the first investment that i've done and it's gone off the rails and they've lost 100 percent of the uh funding that i'd be particularly inclined to invest with them again but if it is somebody that they've got some kind of track record with and they find creative ways of potentially even compensating for those losses either through i don't know equity in future projects even though they're obviously not would be full outside their kind of obligations to do i think it it really depends on how how willing they are to to make amends of whatever's gone wrong and also you know what went wrong um, but i think again it, it boils down to communication and then what's the, what's the resolution and what's the track record of that particular um developer which i've been working with mm -hmm. yep i think really I, good um Dembe, we'll go to you to, next Dembe yes, and then I'll, off. okay i was going to say yes i agree with that because it it depends on the there is a, a, against with a, again so again with their track record and then what are they willing to do for that uh, particular investor in future and then just keeping just the honest the honest truth and the being honest and what they can do and and help to mitigate the situ situation because it's not all about money it, there are other things that the developer can also help. And then they have, they still have skills. And then, as you mentioned earlier, only David, that when you invest, there's always a, a risk. So they, if they can just, I mean, there are other things that they can do to mitigate the situation. Yeah, some really good points. So Lorraine, I'll give you the last the last word on this. Can can a developer keep the reputation even if they've lost some of your money or all of your money in a deal? Well, I wanted to say actually no because you never forget. But um, I would I would agree with the other two panelists that of course they can. You know, the best stories are made from disaster. So if the communication is right and there's creative ways that you they've tried to work with you, or you know they they've suggested something that's outside of the realm of the deal that um, has it has been positive then of course you know they they can reclaim their reputation a bit like politicians i guess they always do things wrong and they bounce back so you know um people people forget but um it's the way you manage it and it's been said already it's absolutely the way that you've managed the situation that you leave it's the, the way you've made people feel at the end of it, I guess, even though they lost all their money. Yeah, I think that's a really good point just in terms of trust and, and, and all of that. Um, so I think there's been some really, really good um, takeaways there, some really good points um, made. Um, and yeah, I think I think it's been very, very valuable um, just being able to, to hear some 
real tangible um, sort of stories and real tangible examples um, from um, from each of you. So I really appreciate that. I've I've had one um, person who's who's on um, sort of text me there and say you could have asked me. I could have come on. Um, which is which I really appreciate um, because we are going to do this again. I think this has been really, really beneficial um, hearing directly from, um, you know, let's say people who have actually done it, which is fantastic. So there's the couple we've covered. Um, there'll be, of course, be lots of shorts and snippets on social media. Um, and I think actually it'll be useful in our next funding focus. If, uh, if each of the panelists are in agreement, we actually take away maybe, you know, do a segment on key takeaways from this. So take away some of the key points that each of you have mentioned and put it almost as a summary um, in the next funding focus. Um, so I so really appreciate that. So, so if you um, stay where you are, I'll give you one last sentence just in a few minutes. We're about to wrap up here. But for those who are not familiar with Prop Funders, you can go on to propfunders.com forward slash welcome. Uh, and it'll explain a bit more about what we do helping developers. Uh, there's a, a six steps to raising funds legally that you can uh, download. Uh, you can also book a, a, a free call with me for 30 minutes about a specific project that you have. Um, so you can access, if you like, contact through propfunders.com forward slash welcome. Um, what you can also do, one of our, our funding partners is Brickflow. Uh, if you have a development, you actually can put all the information from that development um, onto our one of our pages on our site. Um, and it will actually give you an indication, in fact, it will give you a decision in principle um, from over 100 uh, different um, property finance lenders. Um, so it's a great way of just searching the market uh, and seeing is your project viable. So again, a really interesting tool uh, that we have on our platform. And again, if you then want to engage with us, say we do have some services in terms of helping you prepare a funding pack for debt or equity raises. Uh, and also working with you as a, a mentor consultant um, over a period of three months. Uh, effectively, we become a member of your team for three months uh, and help you out with all things funding. So any of those things, reach out to us. Uh, the next webinar then will be on uh, the 16th of October, um, and we'll uh, put the details of the topic and of the guests then uh, at that. Uh, oh, well, the next funding focus, uh, we'll, we'll be talking about that. If there's a topic anybody particularly wants, um, by all means, uh, reach out to us, reach out to the team, and uh, we're happy to um, talk about things that are relevant and discuss things that uh, make sense to our attendees. So with that, I'll actually just come off the this one more time. Uh, I'll give you each 30 seconds each to finish, and then we're done. So we'll go Thembi, uh, Lorraine, and then Aria, please. Okay, I just want to say thank you for this time, for listening to for listening to us, and I hope to you join the next webinar in future. That's me, Dan. Uh, yes, thank you, thank you for having having me, uh, David. Um, uh, parting words, I think, would be: don't go it alone. Um, seek advice, uh, take advice from from people who have done it before. Um, so that you can avoid some of the pitfalls. Aria? Yeah, just to say thank you very much, David. And I think that there's been some excellent discussion on this uh, this webinar. So some important points to, to take away and hopefully learn from for everyone. Absolutely fantastic. And a massive thanks um, on behalf of the Prop Funders team for you three taking time out of your day. I know time's precious, but we really do appreciate it. Um, it, it does give value uh, to what we do here on a monthly basis. Um, this will, of course, be recorded We'll be sticking out on the social media um, chats and in the funding focus and check out our podcast. Um, go to YouTube and see us there. But thank you for attending. Stay safe and we'll see you again next month. All the best, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye, -bye.